It's a pleasure to be presenting uh, this paper to the Radio Club of America. Outside of spark gap in CW, amplitude modulation is one of the oldest forms of modulation there is. Take a carrier and modulate it with the audio. Simple and easy to implement, it's been a, on the air for just a little more than 100 years. Here's what that looks like. We have a carrier signal and a modulating sine wave signal, and below that is the final result. AM modulation is very easy to transmit, and it's easy to receive. In fact, you can build receivers with uh, crystal radio sets, for those of you who are old enough to remember a crystal radio set. Heathkit used to have a... Uh, a crystal radio receiver kit that you could build and there's a schematic diagram of it completely passive just a long wire antenna and some sort of ground and away you went. The downside to amplitude modulation is that it's very inefficient to transmit. The AM carrier uses 66 percent of the transmitter power yet delivers no useful information. Even with modern pulse width modulated uh, AM transmitters, the power consumption for a 50 kilowatt AM station is substantial. So, how do we make AM more efficient? This problem has been studied for a very long time. The solution is to modulate the carrier based upon the audio input to suppress the carrier and reduce its power consumption. The BBC did a lot of work back in the 80s on this and implemented it using analog control. It really never caught on in the U.S. until 2010-2011. Suppressing the carrier based on audio is referred to as modulation dependent carrier level, MDCL. And there are two ways of achieving MDCL, DAM, which reduces the carrier level when audio is low, and AMC, which maintains the carrier at maximum when no audio is present and reduces the carrier and the modulation together by up to 6 dB when modulation is at maximum. With DAM, the carrier is decreased most at moderate modulation levels. Received loudness is increased when the carrier is reduced, which tends to be an artifact that most people don't really appreciate. The carrier is increased at higher modulation levels so the distortion doesn't occur. That's also a little bit different. Uh, as modulation density has substantially increased over the last 20 years with modern audio processing, the efficiency improvement with uh, DAM is reduced. And here's a gain function uh, chart which I borrowed from the folks at Nautel. Uh, was nice of them to let me use it. And it shows you that the percentage of modulation, as the percentage of modulation changes, the amount of power output of the transmitter uh, is increased. And again, the problem now is that with very high modulation densities that we're seeing, uh, you don't really save a, a whole lot of energy. The other way to do MDCL is called AMC where the carrier modulation together are decreased with increasing audio modulation. The carrier is increased to full power during quiet periods when the noise is most easily perceived. As modulation density has substantially increased over the last 20 years with modern audio processing, AMC can generate greater efficiency because the higher uh, modulation densities allow the carrier to be suppressed more. Uh, here's a gain function chart with uh, AMC with 3 dB of carrier suppression. And you can see that as the modulation increases, uh, the amount of carrier and sideband power is greatly reduced. And here's a block diagram showing, again, uh, courtesy of the folks at Nautel, of uh, how you transmit uh, MDCL AMC. And the interesting part of this is uh, the uh, decay and attack times and the lookup table, and uh, with most all modern AM transmitters that are DSP-based, this is quite easy to accomplish. So we wanted to figure out a couple of things here. And so we did some field testing. And what we wanted to do is determine the impact of running uh, MDCL AMC at 3, 4, 5, and 6 dB of carrier suppression. 
and do that at 100%, 125%, and 150% of positive modulation. Town Square Media was nice enough to be our test subject for this at their station KFXD in Boise, Idaho, which is a sports talk station. They have a Nautel NX5 transmitter, which is a five kilowatt transmitter, and it's capable of MDCL at 150% modulation. Now, in order to do that testing, we had to get the FCC to uh, give us a STA so that we could uh, do that testing legally. And uh, we got our STA from the FCC. They turned that in a relatively quick uh, time, uh, less than uh, two weeks, which was uh, pretty quick for the FCC. And we were all set. We wanted to make field strength measurements and audio recordings out in the field. And in order to do that, we needed to find a radio receiver that uh, had a audio bandwidth greater than four and a half kilohertz. Now, uh, over the last 25 or 30 years, the AM band has become very, very noisy. And as a result, uh, receivers typically in cars have a three and a half kilohertz bandwidth. We needed something wider than that to really judge the impact of running very high uh, uh, MDCL levels, upwards of 6 dB of carrier suppression. So we needed to find radios that had it, uh, at least a 6 kilohertz bandwidth. A company called Sea Crane in California makes a Skywave radio. They have selectable audio bandwidths up to 6 kilohertz. We ordered three of those for testing. Again, what we needed to do was uh, quantify the frequency response of those radios. And in order to do that, we needed a shielded enclosure so that we could uh, scrape off as much of the uh, RF noise as possible and uh, test them. And in order to come up with a shielded enclosure, we went over to our local Home Depot and bought a 10 gallon galvanized garbage can. And that was our Faraday shielded enclosure for testing. And uh, here's a picture of our 10 gallon uh, Faraday shield enclosure. And that's a uh, Hewlett Packard HP uh, 8920A that's providing the, uh, the AM signal with uh, a tone on it so that we could uh, test the frequency response. Um, there's still a company out there that actually supports 8920As, it's Amtronics. And we measured all three of the Sea Crane uh, Skyway radios and recorded the results. And John Keene of, of uh, Cavill Merits and Associates did the data work and compared it against the National Radio Systems Committee 75 microsecond AM preemphasis curve, which is uh, part of NRSC1. And that's another sh shot of uh, the uh, 8920A in our uh, 10 gallon uh, Faraday shielded enclosure doing testing, and uh, here are the test results. Uh, 400 hertz is, uh, was our reference. All the radios were caled at 400. The reason we use 400 hertz is that's below the point where the 75 microsecond high frequency preemphasis for AM radio starts taking effect. And you can see the uh, result of all that testing. Those radios, considering they're relatively inexpensive, did a very good job, um, you know, with a dB or so difference between uh, radios, uh, anywhere from 100 hertz to uh, 6 kilohertz. And uh, as I mentioned previously, 400 hertz was the reference frequency for the Skywave radio testing. It's below the start of the 75 microsecond preemphasis curve. All three receivers were set to match output at 400 hertz and then tested. From 200 hertz to 7 kilohertz, they were within 1.5 dB of each other. And that's not bad for a relatively inexpensive uh, radio. And here's the uh, final frequency response curve, um, plus or minus a couple of dB, certainly uh, uh, usable for what we were doing with it. We wanted to be able to record the output off the Skyway radios, and we uh, sourced three Tascam uh, DR05X recorders and the necessary cables so that we could uh, uh, patch the recorders into the Skywave radios and do a recording. And uh, away we went. Everything ran on uh, AA batteries, and so we bought a pile of them so that we had spares. 
And there's a picture of what that setup looks like. Uh, we take the line output off the Skywave radio and we plug it into the line input on the Tascam and off we go. Now we had some help on doing this testing. Our field team consisted of uh, Martin Stafford, who's the director of engineering for Town Square Media, and Jordan Tomlinson, his regional chief engineer in Boise. From Autel, the transmitter manufacturer, we had Jeff Walton come out, who's the regional sales manager. Uh, Jeff spent 20 years in tech support at Nautel before moving over to the sales side of the equation and was uh, intimately familiar with the AM transmitter that we were going to use. We also had uh, a couple of folks from Broadcast Supply Worldwide come out, uh, Tim Schweiger, the president, and Brian Seeley, director of sales and marketing, to, uh, to provide some more hands for us. We wanted to measure field strength, and in order to do that, we rented a Potomac Instruments a PI-4100 field strength meter. And we used that to check the older uh, Potomac Instruments FIM-41 that Town Square had. They had a pair of those. And uh, here's a picture of uh, Martin Stabbert with one of the older uh, FIM-41s uh, out in the, near the transmitter site in a subdivision. And uh, Tim uh, Schweiger standing right next to him. And the interesting part about this is we did all this calibration work and uh, uh, finished up and got in the car and left just about the time the police showed up because apparently the neighbors called the police and wanted reporting strange guys walking around on a street with a bunch of gear and looking weird. And, you know, that's pretty much how it went. Um, there's a picture of the uh, uh, PI-4100 um, which is a very interesting piece of hardware for measuring field strength. It uh, basically tells you what you're doing, where you're at, how far you are from the source. And if you look carefully at that picture, you can see it's uh, giving you uh, the land launch of your location. It's telling you the distance to the transmitter site. It's telling you what direction to point it in. And it records all of that internally, and you can download all of it after the fact. Additionally, we had a three-phase power logging system that we attached to the feed to the transmitter that allowed us to measure the transmitter power consumption and record it on a second-by-second -second basis. And uh, here's a picture of, uh, that's Jeff Walton on the left side there, and Brian Seeley's in the, uh, wearing the hat with the black t-shirt, and, and it's Tim Schweigert and Martin Stabbert, and uh, that's the transmitter site in Boise. We did testing at the 2 millivolt per meter and 0.5 millivolt per meter uh, contour locations. We set up two sites at 2 millivolt per meter, and those were both manned by the Town Square folks. And then the 0.5 millivolt uh, per meter contour location was manned by the BSW folks and myself. That location was 60 miles from the transmitter site. In the six hours that we were at that location, we didn't see a single vehicle come by. And those are the FCC contour plots showing you the, uh, the, the light, uh, light green is the 2 millivolt per meter contour, and the dark green is the 0.5 millivolt per meter contour off the FCC files. And that's a picture of the uh, location where we were for 0.5 millivolt per meter. Uh, out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, some gravel road by the side of uh, absolutely nowhere. Our testing matrix was a uh, set of baseline reference, which was 100% symmetrical modulation at authorized power of 5 kilowatts. And then do 125% positive uh, MDCL at 3 dB, 4 dB, 5 dB, and 6 dB of AMC. Increase the positive modulation to 150% with a 1.76 power increase, which was referred to as enhanced MDCL. And then at 140% positive enhanced modulation. And then 150, uh, just standard. Now, uh, this is one of the locations for the uh, 2 millivolt per meter uh, town square locations. And that's... Uh, uh, with the FIM-41 on the back of the truck. And again, these locations were out very far out of town. So what happened here was we ended up doing running the testing at lower than the licensed 5 kilowatts. 
And the reason that occurred was we were concerned about how much power the antenna phaser and tuners could take without damage at 150% positive modulation in enhanced MDCL with an additional 1.76 dB of carrier power. Uh, obviously, we didn't want to let the smoke out of anything. My chart here has got a typo on it. It's not microvolts a meter, it's millivolts per meter. There's a typo there, except my apologies for it. Our first column there shows us uh, what the uh, field strength is at 100% symmetrical modulation, and that's uh, 610 uh, millivolts a meter. The AC power consumed by the transmitter, again, we reduced power uh, the output power on the transmitter slightly just to uh, make sure we didn't blow anything up. Power consumption was 5.26 uh, kilowatts. And then to the next column over, we have uh, MDCL AMC at 125% positive modulation at 3 dB of AMC. You can see the field strength has dropped from 610 millivolts a meter down to 436, which by the way, works out to be about a 3 dB reduction. And again, at 4 dB of AMC, you can see that we have about a 4 dB reduction in uh, field strength, 5 dB, 6 dB. Same thing. And you can also take a look, uh, if we uh, go to the right, the AC power consumption in kilowatts is listed, again, right off the power monitoring system that we installed. And you can see um, the power of the transmitter has dropped rather dramatically based on how much carrier suppression we were running. With the highest amount of uh, reduction in uh, power consumed uh, at 6 dB of carrier suppression. The reduction in power is about 77%, which is pretty dramatic. And imagine this being a 50 kilowatt station where these numbers would be 10 times greater in terms of power consumption. Uh, it's a pretty significant reduction in power. We didn't find any uh, benefit to, to running enhanced MDCL or greater than 125% positive modulation. When we looked at the technical challenges, um, does the antenna system have the power handling capability to take that kind of uh, additional power input? And the answer was no, at least on our test setup. And then there's a lack of transmitters capable of running enhanced or at 150% positive modulation. There's some regulatory constraints also. Would the FCC uh, uh, be predisposed to actually approve uh, running that setup at 150% modulation at 1.76 uh, 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 dB increased power. And uh, we got the distinct feeling that they weren't all that uh, thrilled about doing it. So at which point we decided that we'd simply run the testing at 125% positive modulation at AMC 3, 4, 5, and 6 dB. And there's a picture of the test setup out in the middle uh, of nowhere at the, uh, and again, another typo, it should be uh, millivolts per meter location. And uh, that's uh, Brian Seeley making a measurement with uh, the Potomac uh, PI-4100. So what have we learned from the result of the testing? Higher modulation density gives uh, the MDACL system the ability to suppress the carrier at a much, to a much greater extent for a longer period of time. At 6 dB of AMC, uh, there's a 77 uh, percent reduction in transmitter power consumption. There's a slight degradation in fringe coverage at AMC levels greater than 3 dB. However, let's, let's cut to the chase. Both Town Square and Bonneville Broadcasting are running 6 dB AMC on their stations that have transmitters that are capable of doing that and have been doing that since 2020 with zero listening, listener complaints and a significant savings in power. Here's a, a picture of the uh, NX50 transmitter uh, user interface for KSL uh, radio in Salt Lake City. They're uh, running uh, AMC at 6 dB of carrier suppression. And you can see that the preset set for uh, set point is 48,500 watts because they're running uh, HD radio on AM. And the forward transmitter power is at 12.1 kilowatts. Again, a significant savings in, uh, in power consumption. And here's a close-up picture of one of the uh, Seacrane Skywave radios driving a uh, 
Tascam recorder and a pair of headphones for monitoring. So special thanks to the Nautel folks for letting me steal their graphics uh, for use on slides 10, 12, and 13. Thanks to Town Square's Martin Stabbert and Jordan Tomlinson for being our test subjects, and Tim and Brian at BSW for their, all their assistance with testing and gear sourcing. And with that, uh, if we have any questions. <laughs>
see that somehow there needs to be a shift in what's available on AM receivers out there and it's not as popular as some of the others. Like who's going to absorb that expense? Well, there, yeah, there's, you know, in, in a perfect world, we really like to have the world's greatest receivers. The problem is you've got a cost issue and, um, you know, we're in a battle to keep radio into the dashboards of vehicles. Okay. It's a battle. And uh, there are some uh, EVs, electric vehicles, that don't uh, have AM uh, reception capability because the cars generate so much RFI that AM would be completely wiped out. Um, you, you, it's a problem. And, you know, AM isn't dead. Uh, you know, four out, of ten, uh, four out of the top 10 billing radio stations in the U.S. are AM. And they're like WSB and KNX and WGN and KOA and um, the concept that we can get rid of AM radio um, is a very interesting one until there's some sort of giant snowstorm or tornado or something else, at which point every radio and every car is tuned to the big AM in town to get all that traffic and information. And you can look at the uh, Nielsen PPM numbers every time there's a big snowstorm in Denver, KOA's uh, PPM numbers go through the roof because everybody's trying to figure out how to get to school or what schools are closed or um, you know uh, what highways are shut down or, uh, and that's how they get it. Uh, so, you know, satellite radio is cool and streaming is cool, but, you know, when you need a weather report or uh, why is the traffic not moving on the 405, you tend to go back to AM. Um, uh, there's so much good data in there, and, I, and I'm not as well versed on AM as I probably should be doing. Just I pulled things right out of your presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, we get a lot of comments, you know, traffic and weather on the eights, right? Oh, ex you know, absolutely. And, and uh, it's, uh, anyway, I, I don't need to belabor the point that AM is still popular. And, and it's, so Mike, uh, Mike, where do you go from here? You know, you've got some data now. Uh, you know, you have a, a much better handle on what's going on. Where do you take this? Well, I think the interesting thing was the minute the pandemic hit, um, virtually everybody that uh, uh, that we deal with had uh, went out and if they had transmitters capable of running greater than 3 dBMC, they were turning it up. And, uh, you know, Town Square and, uh, and Bonneville were all about uh, doing that. And, uh, and that's how, you know, we were actually able to confirm how much power savings based on their actual power bills. And that was just the power savings was directly into the transmitter. There are uh, other uh, power savings that happen. First off, you generate less heat into the building, so the air conditioning uh, requirements drop. And uh, Town Square's uh, KEL uh, in Shreveport is in a building that has uh, 15 tons of air conditioning. Okay, it gets hot in Shreveport. And so when they, ran, uh, when they went from 3 dB to 6 dB of uh, carrier suppression, it uh, not only dropped their power consumption on the transmitter, but there were requirements for air conditioning. So big savings there. Um, so my, okay. Mike, what, what about the 150%? Um, I, I know you, you kind of backed off of that pretty quick and you said I, something to the effect that the FCC wasn't excited about that. Is 125 all we're gonna, I mean, it, is that or, it? Yeah, currently uh, every AM broadcaster can run 125% positive. Um, we actually ran uh, the Boise station at 150% and then 150% at 1.76 uh, enhanced uh, MDCL mode. And frankly, the, the, the uh, benefit to doing that was relatively marginal. And we were a little concerned about, you know, the, the problem you run into is tuners and phasers aren't set up for those tower levels and you're going to blow something up. And we were a little concerned about that's a three tower array for the Boise station. We we're concerned about smoke and stuff and blowing right. it up. Now, what, what about, uh, I, I got to ask this question. What, 
What about the sound differential between 125 and 150? Well, on the, on the sky crane, um, on the C crane skyway radios, because of the detector they're using in there, that we didn't note any greater amounts of distortion. But they're using a Scilabs chipset in there that's the same one that the automotive industry uses. So it's a really good chipset. And that Scilabs chipset, just as a short uh, side note there, it uh, allows us to change the uh, recovered uh, audio bandwidth. That's a really great chip. Um, and, and that's a really great radio. And that works really well. Now, on a $6 radio with a, a very crude detector, um, I, I don't know what the distortion looks like. And I don't know if we, as broad people in the broadcast industry, I don't know if we want to broadcast for the lowest common denominator. Um, you know, we, we talk about, so we do, we have some business in the automotive industry. And I can tell you right now, there isn't a car radio that's made in the last 15 years that has greater than three and a half kilohertz bandwidth. That being said, most of the broadcasters that we deal with are typically running a five and a half kilohertz bandwidth or six kilohertz bandwidth. Um, and that's all done with the audio processing. So our, our, uh, you know, here's the quick plug. Our AM uh, processor allows us to uh, set the transmitted bandwidth <clears throat> anywhere from two and a half kilohertz to NRSC, which is nine kilohertz and 500 hertz increments. And it resets all of the multiband processing based on what your uh, uh, target bandwidth is. Margaret, over to you for more questions. Um. I'm looking at, I think you, you've kind of touched on this, that what the car radios have versus what someone might have as, I guess, portable or in their home stereo equipment. Although I have to say, I bought equipment recently and it's all streaming. There, there's no off-air reception. Uh, well, you know, the interesting thing is streaming all works until you have a massive power failure. That's right. That's okay. Right. And, and cell phones all work until you have a massive power failure. And, uh, you know, we had an 18 hour power outage during the snowmageddon a couple of years ago in uh, Colorado and all the cell sites were all down in three or four hours. And uh, our, our interweb was off the air in about an hour. And at which point, you know, I've got some of these uh, sea cranes, uh, skyway radios and a couple of double A's and you know what, I got KOA and I'm getting all my news and information. So. Yes. You know, all, all that streaming stuff and everything else tends to be relatively uh, fragile uh, when you have those kind of uh, snowmageddon events or, or tornadoes or, you know. So, so Mike, uh, let's, let's go back to the, uh, the noise floor in uh, the AM band. And you, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, over the last, I don't know, 20 years, it's gone up by 30, 30 dB. And, uh, you know, I don't think the lid is on this yet. Um, when we start wirelessly charging EVs, there will be propagated noise. Well, Tim, is it inductively charging EVs, yes, for all intents and purposes, will completely decimate the AM band and virtually all of the... Um, Amateur radio HF bands. Yes. Okay, because they're planning on doing 10 kilowatt charging inductively. Yep. And they're at about 94% efficient. Which means that at 10 kilowatts, you have 600 watts of either heat loss or RFI. RFI. And it, it's going to be a, a complete unmitigated disaster because apparently EV owners are too lazy to plug the car in. Okay, it, it's it's insane. I mean, it's just insane. Uh, the good news is is that the NAB has got a group that's working on this, uh, and they're 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 really working hard to try to make sure that this doesn't wipe out AM. And and there's some other issues. Some of the charge, the initial charging stuff, also put a bunch of noise up into the. Uh, aeronautic bay, the uh, yes, right, because that's all. Guess what? 
all toms for aircraft are am and uh, anyway there, there's a lot of pushback on this but it, it's something that absolutely needs some focus yeah and uh you, you mentioned about fighting the war uh to keep am radios uh in cars for very good reasons and you stated several of them um you know who is fighting that war i mean who who is the advocate to do the right thing? Well, first off, the, the biggest advocate for doing the right thing are, is Joe Consumer. And, and currently, the last round of, of research that I saw said that 81% uh, of, of new car buyers would not buy a vehicle uh, that did not have an AM radio in it. So as long as we can keep uh, relevancy in terms of why, why do you need AM? Because, you know, when, when the world comes to a halt, it's the only thing that gets through. And you also have to consider that all the, uh, uh, the FEMA stations uh, that they've hardened up for uh, disasters are all AMs. So they're not, they're not hardening uh, FM sites up for disaster communications. They're doing AMs. Uh, so, uh, again, some adult supervision needs to be, to be uh, applied here. Uh, the first thing we've got to do is we can't let inductive charging destroy the bands. Right. The second thing we've got to do is the reason the noise floors are up by 30 dB is because uh, people have built all these switching power supplies and LED lights, and they get their FCC type acceptance, and then they go into serial production, and they take out all the RFI filtering stuff to save a penny. And, right. and because none of those are ever tested after they go into serial production, unless, you're right, unless somebody's got a grow light factory and they're making, they're, they're growing pot plants and it's wiping out three, you know, square miles of uh, public safety. Um, it, 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 I don't want to yeah. belabor the point. It's a mess. Okay. It's, uh, it's a mess. Margaret, uh, how about some more questions, Margaret? Um, uh, getting in a little bit different part of this topic is, uh, do modern AM transmitters use adaptive pre-distortion, like uh, pure signal and ham radio, to keep the splatter and the bandwidth down, allowing less noise artifacts? Well, they, they certainly do adaptive pre-correction if they're doing any of the digital mods. So, um, uh, the, and I, the KSL uh, AM uh, runs adaptive uh, pre-distortion to meet mask with uh, the uh, HD radio subcarriers, which uh, you could kind of see in that screenshot that I, I got off the front panel. Um, most AM, most of the other AM transmitters I played at made mask with usually margin to spare. So uh, the only time you really get into uh, potential for splatter is if if you figured out some new and exciting way to run the, uh, to try to run greater than 95% uh, negative modulation, we typically uh, set negative modulation to be 95 to 98%. We don't want to go anywhere near 100%. Um, the minute you hit carrier cutoff, uh, all bets are off, and then you'll have lots and lots of splatter. Uh, if the transmitter is not capable of, of successfully hitting 125% positive modulation, you can, you can end up with uh, some splatter issues there. Um, there are yearly requirements for mask measurements with AM broadcasters. So uh, the other thing is that if the transmitter is not making authorized power, generally means that it's lost some modules. And then you need to have a FET party to replace FETs. And I smoked a couple of, uh, I've installed a, probably 18 or 20 uh, AM processors and I've smoked about four or five transmitters that weren't uh, capable of making full authorized. And then we had a big FET party. So we called up DigiKey in order to pile of FETs and then we fixed them. Um, Mike, uh, it, tremendous ideas here too, but you know, this uh, savings of uh, power consumption, um, you know, except for the, uh, the, the big guys that are, they're still doing well in the AM business. Those regional, um, you know, kilowatt uh, day timers and, uh, uh, you know, 500 watt stations that serve the rural communities in, in this country are vital. And anything that can be done to lower their costs 
this, this is a huge deal. I mean, it's a, it's a make or break deal when it comes to staying alive. Well, and, and it's the single biggest line item expense for an AM uh, operating expense is power consumption. So um, uh, like I said, once, once we had the data, um, the, the guys at Town Square, the guys at uh, Bonneville jumped right in and they were like, we're gonna run these at 60 B, off we go. And, uh, and again, uh, KEL in Shreveport a, is a news talker. It's the number one station in Shreveport. They went to 60 B uh, AMC and didn't get any complaints. So um, you, you would think that with the number one rated talker in a market, if there were issues with listeners, they'd hear about it. Yep. Margaret, one more before we uh, let Mike go. Um. Um, most of the comments are, are, are back on the, uh, the noise issue. And one asks, uh, you know, talks about broadcast industry needing to lobby against RF pollution. Is there any reflection on such efforts going on out there from the broadcast industry, not just waiting for John Q. Public? Or the NAB, et cetera. Well, the, the, it, look, the NAB is, is absolutely got some of the brightest people uh, working on this noise floor thing and they're working on, you know, reining in inductive charging and they're, uh, you know, because the NAB, you know, is made up of broadcasters and so they're, they're really focused in on it. Um, but it's a, it's a problem and, uh, uh, you know, all those devices that are out there that don't have the RFI shielding in them that they were type accepted with or come on this. All right, Mike, uh, thanks so much. And Margaret, thank you for moderating. And uh, <laughs> let's go over to uh, Jim Brakehall for your comments and our next speaker. Thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you, uh, Tim. And uh, thank you, Mike. 